Hi everyone, I guess we are live. I screwed up as, <laughs> as expected. Hi everyone, uh, welcome from the localization news. My name is Andre Zito. This will be the second live stream that we're doing together as a group for Multilingual. Uh, I'm not here alone. I have my guests from the tech episode of the localization news. We had a pretty good discussion about TMS and OCR last time. So I would like to welcome back Oksana and Beat. Hey guys. Hi everyone. Hello. Hey, so last time um, we pretty much, I, I remember my usual format for this uh, localization news is that each guest picks an article and then we have a discussion. So last time I just pretty much read the title of the article and then these two were discussing for like one hour about TMSs and brainstorming what we could do. And then Beat brought up the idea that maybe next time we should just talk about internationalization because that's his big passion. And because I recently interviewed Mr. Gilad. Gilad, hello, hello. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> I interviewed Gilad. He's also an internationalization expert and he likes to talk about internationalization. So I decided that we'll bring another guest to this discussion. So today we will have no articles for you. We will just discuss about internationalization. And the way I see this is that we have two OGs here, uh, Beat and Gilad. And I think maybe me and Oksana will be the young people who will be just curious, like what is internationalization and why is it useful? But anyway, I don't we... think you give yourself enough credit. <laughs> <laughs> before we get into that, um, if I set up everything right, you should see the stream. There's a very nice big circle in the middle that is for you guys. And you guys can send us your comments. It will be displayed right there on the stream. Send us your questions, your comments about internationalization and anything else that you want to point out, like my big nose, whatever. So uh, before we start, maybe since we're streaming new under multilingual, maybe you guys can give us a brief introduction about yourself, like a few sentences about what you're doing right now and how you ended up here on this live stream. Who wants to start? Lady first, Oksana, please. Okay. Um, the well-rounded lady, right? Not the geeky one. Yeah, well-rounded, not geeky. <laughs> I'm here because you invited me, <laughs> but I my connection to the localization industry in general is because my first sort of career was in translation and localization. And now um, I'm more into data science and natural language processing. Um, I'm basically do a lot of computational linguistics work uh, and uh, a lot of sort of research into machine translation and stuff like that. And I did my, um, I have a company, it's called Metamova, you can look it up. Um, and we did localization engineering for a while. Um, and now, now we are more into data science. So I'm, I'm here, like, I'm here to provide more of a data science input on language and the and the translation process but i also i do have i do have some experience in in acquisition engineering and the tech side of things and and um but i think internationalization in particular is something that i didn't get to work in a lot and so i'm pretty excited about this episode and i have some questions <laughs> okay Beth, what about you yeah, I'm uh, Beat Stauber. I'm a, mostly a localization engineer, solutions architect. I've um, been doing that for 25 years um, for, a, for a large tech company for most of my career and then for a couple of different localization vendors. I'm currently working for GlobalMe and uh, managing an engineering team there. You know, what I was just always thinking is that you're very mysterious about the big company. <laughs> but but I think that when I tag you on LinkedIn, like people can see your profile, right? It's, it's yeah, people can there. go look it up. It's um, They'll see it. But it, I'm, I'm trying to keep things kind of neutral when I talk about specific work we do and specific challenges and um, because I don't want need to throw anybody under the bus, right? So right. <laughs> um, I, I really like to talk about the, the problems in general rather than pointing out, you know, for, very specific things that um, could be tracked back to you know right. a company or specific work. 
And so who's not mysterious about his previous company is Gilad, right? Mr. Microsoft. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the opposite, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so hi, everybody. I'm uh, Gilad al um, formerly of uh, Microsoft. I spent about 20 years there working on internationalization in, uh, through uh, a, a various set of roles, including quality assurance and program management. Uh, currently, I am the... Um, uh, committee chairman for the Standard Institute of Israel for the committee that deals with Hebrew standardization uh, in computer. Uh, I also am an independent consultant uh, under the World Ready Guide's name uh, and just passionate internationalization guy, the, the internationalization warrior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. For everyone who's interested, I'll do a little self promo. Uh, we just did an interview with Gilad that I published, I think, like two weeks for the localization podcast, where we talk about the issues with bi localization, which is very closely related to internationalization. And I think maybe we'll probably share some of the stories and the challenges in this discussion. Yeah, that's a really good episode because it really goes into the internationalization aspects of, nice. of yeah. Baidai. It's, it's really good. I just listened to it a few days ago, actually. Yes. So you already know Gilad inside out. Yes. <laughs> you know that he likes paragliding. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, hello to, to people on YouTube. We have a couple of comments from Julia Greco and Fernanda, my ex-colleague. That's ex-colleague as well. I mean, sorry, your colleague still. Current colleague. Yes. Hello, hello, hello. So let's start the discussion. Internationalization. First of all, it's a word, word that I have a lot of trouble even saying in the first place <laughs> because it's very difficult. But I think I'm doing a pretty good job right now. What I want to ask is what exactly it is for you, internationalization. Because to me, when I started working in the industry as an engineer, uh, we didn't speak much about internationalization. And by the way, when I started working, I was working on Microsoft products. Mm. So you probably saw me running through through the hallways trying to find people. To I, was, I was working for Moravia, so no, I didn't see you running around Microsoft's office. So what is internationalization? Let's, let's imagine that people who are not familiar with the term uh, are watching this. How would you explain internationalization to let's say, newbies. You know, it's interesting that you're saying it wasn't a term that was talked about a lot or a thing that was talked about a lot, which is crazy, right? Because it's everything. It's everything when it comes to localization world. Without internationalization, you got you got nothing, right? You're 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 out of luck basically because it's world readiness in a in a really if you want to use one term to say it different, it's world readiness. Mm -hmm. And that but then you can break down into a lot of different categories, which we're, I'm sure we're going to get into. Uh, what do you, what somebody else, how did, how did they look at it? I, I look at it as having the ability to create an inclusive experience for any user around the world. Mm -hmm. In me, so I never had, I never had the chance to actually like participate in the transition process. Um, and do internationalization there. But from the point of view of a localization engineer, I think it's a way to avoid a lot of work um, later on. Mm -hmm. And it's it's and it's a big part of the actual software development. Yeah, it's one piece is the work avoidance part, right? It's the, the, the user experience, the end user experience is the other part. And um, the, yeah, we can break it down from there. Yeah, you, you, know, you know where I stopped, and this was actually the second question that I had prepared for you guys, is <laughs> that, that, that was the funny thing, because you said that you heard internationalization, internationalization everywhere, but I didn't. Do you think it's mostly because you were working as an engineer, and for you it's like your bread and butter that you always need to do? Because for project managers, do you think that project, manager, project managers wake up every day and they think about internationalization probably no i don't think you hear it everywhere that's the problem it oh, should you, you be it right. should be we should be talking about it in all aspects of all everything we do right um it, that is the problem and um that we're going to get into that in more detail like where are the opportunities that are missed why are some companies 
not paying attention to it, which companies are specific examples of companies that do pay attention to it. Um, mm -hmm. I was thinking about that a little bit. You know, I look at um, a company like Netflix that has basically one product, right? Which is their, for, for user facing, it's basically one product, which is their media player. And um, they <laughs> heavily internationalize that, right? They put a lot into it. They, it's totally thought through. It's, it's the, oh, they, ha they have to, they, are, they wanna be in every market in the world. And it's one small product that really doesn't have a lot of features. And um, it, it, it's something I never got to do, by the way. I never get to work on a big project like that, that where you get to go into it really deep. And then the total opposite end is a uh, localization vendor that works with dozens or hundreds of customers and thousands of small products, maybe some bigger products, or a company that it's not, that's not their main thing. They might sell hardware, but they have, you know, still have software products or other content um, and they're not focusing on it as much. Um, so it, it, there's, a, I think there's so much opportunity still. And um, I'd love to talk about where those are um, as part of this discussion, where those are, where I see that uh, things, you know, could be better and how, how can we get there? Mm -hmm. By the way, shout out to Tony Jacobo from Chicago on Facebook. And he actually confirmed that he never heard of internationalization before. So maybe... I guess if it's here, we're finished, right? He, now he knows we can all go home. <laughs> <laughs> One more, one more. <laughs> so, so, uh, okay. How do you, okay. So if it's not, if it's not that popular, how would you guys make it more popular? Like what would be the selling point for internationalization? You did mention some of the very high level things when I ask you what the term means for you, but let's say you're a project manager all on LSP side or you're a manager on the client side. What would be the benefits? Like, Hey, I need to get internationalization right now. Um, I think for a lot of companies, the ability to have internationalization baked in make, makes a lot of sense because it, it's, it's better for their process. One of the things that they learned with me in particular at Microsoft was that when they put me on the quality assurance side of things, meant that I was giving my feedback at a very um, late stage. And that caused a lot of feature teams a lot of pain. And, and, um, and, if, and if you do it right, then you're not going to have to go through that. And, and your ability to go into a market uh, rather e easily is going gonna, is gonna to increase. Uh, not to mention, you know, that, that's from the engineering side. And then there's also the user experience side. And just having a robust enough design and, and giving a, a user a great experience, regardless of where they are, is uh, is something that we're seeing more and more these days. I don't think it was something that we were able to scale a few years ago. So if you're looking at Netflix or Spotify, which are uh, leading the market in terms of the ability of um, the ability to go into a market and do a good job, um, they're probably listening to their users quite quite often, and so their ability to scale and and have good internationalization baked in makes a lot of sense. And I think there's a misconception. Uh, people don't realize that if you have a product that you only release in the source language, in the language that it was originally created, it still needs to be internationalized. It's not um, only tied to products that you're localizing, translating into different languages. Um, so really any product, uh, um, you know, if, if you make a little app that you only, you know, people only use locally and it's a small thing for a very small audience. Okay, maybe it's not that important. Um, I, th I would argue there's still some internationalization that should happen. So let's say you release an Android app, um, you know, and if you show numbers, for example, or uh, dates or things like that, it should still pick up what the operating system is set to, right? So if I, one user has their phone set to Chinese or... Mm -hmm or Spanish or to a different location for whatever reason, maybe because they're traveling, it should still work, right? It should still pick up those settings from, from the operating system. Um, but um, so I think that's, again, that's the biggest misconception that it, it, it's tied to localization translation and it really isn't. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a, an application that's used worldwide and it doesn't 
show decimal uh, separators properly or uh, formatting currency or dates or things like that. And it's not really usable for a lot of users. It's very confusing to use. So really any, any piece of software or web application should be internationalized if, if you want to use it in a larger, uh, for a larger audience. Yeah, we have a question from Tony again. Tony is the guy who has never heard of the term. And he asks, do you call internationalization having clients overseas or expanding business to another country? So I think that for you guys, Beat and Gilad, I think the term is so ingrained for you that you're talking like very high level. Uh -huh. <coughs> so maybe try to explain it like grade five. <laughs> to your kids how would you explain internationalization to your kids mm. like like give us some example like you guys were trying to give us an example with with the with the android app or with netflix so maybe mm -hmm. like something specific well it's basically no matter where the user is in the world no matter what language the user speaks they should be able to use the application or the the, the web web application. Let's just say application for the simplicity of it. They should be able to use the application uh, to the exact same level as anybody else in the world, right? They shouldn't run into any issues where they can't use a certain feature or can't figure out what's displayed on the screen um, because something is not ready to to or something didn't adapt to their either language or the location they're in or to call uh, some cultural aspect uh, that they're used to. That's mm -hmm. how I would explain it. Uh, In-country example of that is uh, from my time at Microsoft, 45% uh, of users in Israel use the English version of Windows. They don't, they don't care much for the localized version, which is translated. They just use English because uh, that's what they prefer. But they do have multiple input methods, so they want to be able to type in Hebrew and English, for example. They do want to interact with date formats that are relevant to them. They do want to have an alternate calendar that's lunar-based because that's how the government tracks holidays, for example. So um, just having that functionality, that robust functionality, uh, even on a product that isn't translated, uh, makes a lot of sense for these users to be able to have a good experience. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I try and answer that and you tell me if there are any wrong ideas in that definition it's almost like internationalization is sort of developing your software it having in mind that it will be used um in many different places in the world and that it will be translated eventually right so when, when wherever in like whatever place in the world you launch it it should kind of seamlessly adapt to 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 um to how people sort of see different concepts there, like dates and, and currencies and stuff like that. But also in case you actually decide to translate it, it has to be possible uh, to, to do it because sometimes people sort of uh, disregard that and then they find that they need to translate something into 20 languages. And it turns out that you have to rewrite everything because you didn't handle the strings correctly. So I feel like there are a couple of levels to that. Um, and and on the level of programming, um, there is also some internationalization uh, concepts that need yes. to be applied. What do I you think about that? You know, I can oversimplify it for you. You know what it is? Um, imagine you're a child in Europe and you see this great toy um, and the toy maker from the States says, wow, we're going to localize this for you. And they put all the labels in Italian, right? And they send it over to Italy. And you're like, great, the toy is here. And then you plug it in and you realize that the voltage is 220 in Italy and it's 110 in America and your toy catches on fire and, and melts in front of your face. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, that's, that's a really poor ending. Yeah, but no, yeah that's true. true. <laughs> it's actually good, Oksana, what you said. You know, there are different aspects. So it actually broke it down into four categories, internationalization. Um, so the first category is... Issues that affect the end user of a product that is not localized. We just talked about that, right? Let's say you you release a product in in English only, for example, um, and uh, so it has to be able to display uh, uh, 
tape formats, uh, the decimals, um, time, um, it has to handle user input output. We can get into more of that later. Um, so that's one category. The other category is um, international, internationalization issues that affect the localization engineers when they try to get it ready for translation. So if we need to translate a product, there's certain things we run into that we can't you know, fix um, that it, it, the end user may not necessarily see them, but we can't, or they would eventually, I guess, once we can't, if we can't translate it, but things that keep us from getting it ready for translation. So there could be hard-coded strings, could be string concatenations, there could be um, even just poorly written English or source user interface, right? I mean, it, um, but that's more translator issue. But um, so there are technical barriers that, will will a uh, localization engineer will run into then the third category is issues that affect the translator so those are for example inconsistent terminology in the source for the same calling the same thing different things right um, um, things that are not clear um, branding mistakes um, in, in when they talk about you know product names for example things like that so actual content issues string concatenation too that affects translators that's category three and then the last category is issues that affect the end user of a localized product so once you go through all the the other stages um, there could still be issues that um, affect the localized uh, product for example poorly chosen font for Thai that makes it hard to read. Um, that would be, a, you know, doesn't affect the LE while they're getting it ready for translation, doesn't affect the translator, doesn't affect the English product, the source product, but affects the localized product. It's not clear on the screen. Uh, you know, Chinese, where you have a lot of strokes and you have the font's too small, the, the, the strokes blend into each other, stuff like that, um, you know, truncations, things like that. Um, so those are the kind of four categories I can think of. We could probably spend an hour on each yeah. category. I, I learned about the Asian fonts the hardware, the hard way. I think it was one of the first projects that I led when I was in Moravia for Microsoft. I think I was maybe 20 or 21. And we were using the Log Studio. So that was Microsoft's internal tool for software localization. And we didn't mm -hmm. know anything about Asian localization and that we had to change the fonts for Asian languages. So everything was pretty much using, using Sego, Segoi. Mm -hmm. That was the new font with, with Vista, yeah. I think. So we put um, everything and then we learned the hard way. I think it came in with uh, Windows 8. So yeah, going, eight, or, right? 8 or XP, somewhere around there. Um, yeah, and it's interesting. So right, uh, Microsoft uh, OS is they have font fallback, which mm -hmm. works pretty well. But do you want to have Microsoft dictate what font it falls back to? Um, you know, because it tries to detect, and I've seen issues with, uh, especially with Chinese, where it actually detects against Japanese because they share some of the characters, right? The kanji characters. So it actually applies a Japanese font, or even that some glyphs have a, have a Chinese font applied and some glyphs have a Japanese font applied, and then they actually, different glyphs look differently, right? So that way you do want to specify your fonts. You want to actually control what your uh, what font is used in the UI. Mm -hmm. I would also add to all this um, at this stage of actually developing, uh, let's say, a website, the page. Um, if you are serious about the internationalization, it's really cool to test uh, like right to left um, languages mm -hmm. and um, and actually test how long, um, like how long can your string be and still look good on your page. Right, because because sometimes English has really short words. Right, even if you translate into something like Ukrainian, which has like moderately um, long words, the whole page could could break, and then you'll have to go and like change your HTML uh, layout and stuff like that. So you could actually it's it's really helpful to keep that in mind, even even when you like develop the HTML page. And I think that also that also um, is a part of inter internationalization. Yeah, it's a uh, localization. I think is the the term you're uh, probably looking for. There's pseudo localization and uh, pseudo mirroring, which is the next level of pseudo uh, localization where you uh, make the UI right to left, and you also uh, play with the strings so that they have a right to left property to them. Yeah, so, yeah. So pseudo translation is basically when you insert like gibberish, but in different with different characters and different length and different fonts. 
and then you mm. check how, so you know you're like you're not actually translating but you're pretending like you translated something into into um some and you know non-standard for western maybe world it, language it's a smart process by the way because if you have a database of localized strings that you've used for a very long time you probably know how long or how how what the length is of the longest string that you're trying to display is and so you don't have to go with the largest one you can find but you can actually be more accurate and say you know we know for norwegian the string is very very long and we display it here and so when we go for the pseudo localization process we're going to go with that length with that particular length and be very accurate so you're always accommodating for strings that you actually have in your database yeah that's interesting or you could a cool idea is if you don't have any any like data to fall uh to um machine translate into that language, and, mm -hmm. and because it's going to be like way more accurate than, than inserting gibberish, and the length mm -hmm. will be sort of comparable. Um, yeah, yeah, machine translations made pseudo localization so much easier, right? Um, uh, but ideally, I mean, on a UI, you want to have it be as dynamic as possible, right? You don't want to have a lot of constrained spaces where the text can't grow, and then you have to worry about does it get too long, and then you have to test literally every single text control. However, of course, you're going to run into limitations there, too, with the dynamic UI. I mean, HTML is a really beautiful um, example. Actually, HTML is quite well internationalized when, you, when it comes to dynamic layout, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you create some fixed size boxes, which you can, of course, define, it, nothing is fixed size in HTML. And you can, you know, generally, um, I mean, you can, you can, you can set your page to a fixed width, but nowadays with responsive design, people don't do that anymore. Um, so responsive design is actually one of the greatest things <laughs> ever invented for localization um, because it, it forces people to create a totally dynamic web, web page you know, design and really get it, get away from anything static in width mm -hmm. or height. Mm -hmm. um, so, But just as a, as a general technology, HTML has always been uh, had that kind of dynamic layout ability, right? Um, it, it, unless you use anything fixed, you you were able even you know twenty years ago you were able to size your browser and um, it would adapt, like tables would adapt and columns would adapt, and um, you know you might get really really long things, and you know you're still gonna have issues with Russian, for example, where you have very long words and very wide characters. Um, but um, HTML is really is really a good example. There's still a lot of things you can do wrong with HTML, of course. Um, for example, you know, forcing line breaking, um, placing um, items with a, you know fixed coordinates, for example. Um, um, so the, there's still a lot of stuff to avoid. But overall, it's actually quite localization friendly. Yeah, but I think long strings up to translation can really break the sort of adaptive design because when you really meant to have a small object like on the page just because it looks good and, and it has a string something like go, you know, like a button that said go, and then you translate it into like an Eastern European language, it's going to get much bigger and, and your whole design may, may look um, not that great. And then, and then, but then I can't tell you what a pain it is to, as a translator, have this character restriction that's two characters. And for for a synthetic language like Ukrainian or Russian, two characters is nothing. It's you, you're not gonna you're not gonna pass any information. Um, so you have to you have to keep that in mind. Probably even when you design uh, the page, that you know that you're gonna have you're gonna have some long words um, in other languages. Yeah, it definitely doesn't um, free you from having to do some kind of pseudo localization. I mean, you still have to you still sh you still should do the testing uh, with longer longer text beforehand you know um go buttons are bad anyway um they're, they're bad from an accessibility point of view too because the person who's who can't see and just the screen reader just says go you don't really know what it's doing right it should actually have a more specific action um but that's a whole separate podcast about yes. accessibility, yes. accessibility. Yes. That's, but that's, we do actually there's a little bit of overlap right i mean we do um i think the reason just as a little side tangent the reason why internationalization people care about accessibility is because it affects part of the population and we want to make things accessible for everybody it has nothing to do with language or culture but it has to do with um you know with not 
allowing a person to use an application. So accessibility is something that kind of bleeds into into it, even though it's a whole separate specialty. But um, we tend to we tend to care about it, and I see companies care more about it. So to me, it is kind of part of it. Um, but again, it's not because of different countries that you want to put your product into, but just uh, um, more people be able to use the application. Yeah, and even like for the translators, they don't they don't get the context, or very rarely get the context for the go button. And then and then you risk um, you know having something that is completely unusable once it's translated because nothing really makes sense yep. um, in the yep. language. That's a category three issue for my previous categories. <laughs> Issues that affect the translator, right? And then eventually the end user. So we, yeah. um, we can talk clarity, about clarity. Clarity of, of items. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, we can talk about the the how it, this affects translators later on. That was also one of my questions. For now, I just want to go back to the chat because actually people are sending us questions and commenting. So first of all, shout out to Celine from Argentina. She said, interesting topic, loving it from LinkedIn. And we have two questions that were submitted around 10 minutes ago. So let's get back to those. And these are good questions. So Artem on Facebook, I'll get back to you in a while. For now, let's answer the question for Rick Verbeek from LinkedIn. And this is a good one. How do you make your developers aware of the importance of internationalization? Guidelines, style guides, process descriptions? Question mark. Gilad, maybe you can start since you were close to the um, developers. You know, one of the things I faced at Microsoft is is what we're talking here. What we're talking about right now is how do you raise awareness? And often the localization team is perceived as a text. And that's not a very good place to be in because nobody wants to pay a tax and nobody wants to be in a position where they're begging their feature team to fix things. And so um, after we shipped Windows 7, uh, we started what we called walkthroughs and they were mandatory. And every feature team with their program managers and their testers and their developers had to go through a design walkthrough where they show us what they're designing and we provide all the feedback we can during that session um, so that they know what are some of the design issues that we're looking for, what are the design issues that we're concerned about, and, and then they go and build the product. And then once they start building the product, we start meeting with them on a regular basis. The worst thing you can do is give a developer a checklist because that he, he's got he or she's got plenty of checklists. And most likely you're going to see a checklist that says internationalization. <laughs> and um, and that's never going to be good enough, right? Because it's a very deep bucket. The idea is not to just hand it over to them and say, good luck. It's not just the developer, it's the designer, it's the developer, it's the tester. They all need to be in the same page. And what you want to do is work like a consultant you want to make yourself available across the development cycle so that they have somebody to ask the questions and provide them with clear answers so that they can just go and work on it and not have to start researching things. Um, you want to make sure that you're recognized as a subject matter expert for that particular topic so that they don't walk around the hallways looking for more answers and then pick the most convenient one, which is most likely the one that's easiest to develop. Um, you you want to have a vision of what you want to do with your product so that the developer can and the designer can, can align to that. Um, so you really want to be part of a larger process by being uh, a subject matter expert that's available to them through the easy times and through the hard times. Like sometimes you're going to have to tell them, you know, I can see this bug and, and I'm going to let it go and I want you to let it go now. And that's another thing. Like how do you clear the way once you start developing momentum, right? Like you start developing the product. Now you're reaching the end stages. Now you're responsible for ensuring that momentum keeps uh, going. And so you want to even clear the way and say, we're gonna work on certain things on another release. So I think just handing it, handing it over to somebody and saying, figure out internationalization is not an approach that's sustainable. 
but being somebody that's part of a larger process and a subject matter expert is probably the way to go. Yeah, I think people are not going to understand it, right? If you just throw a checklist at them, they, they don't even have the context to to understand it. Um, and I think another part that that you didn't mention was there has to be some kind of buy-off in management that this is an important part, that this is a mandatory feature of the product. And, you know, it's an overarching feature. It's not a feature that's isolated. It, it touches everything, every part of the product, right? It touches the UI. It touches the code. Um, it touches infrastructure, um, supposedly, if you're, like if you're storing data somewhere in the database and recalling data, that, that needs to work too, right? Depending on the language of the data. So I think one thing we did with uh, in my previous company, we went to for some large products, and that's maybe another thing to to mention that it's much more effective for larger products because you get so much more out of it. The return on investment is much bigger. You know, we do in the global media, we do hundreds of products um, every year and some of them are very small and to go back to the customer and talk to them for two hours about internationalization may not be, you know, their ROI may not be there. Sometimes we just fix stuff. We may tell them a few things, you know, but we just fix stuff. But when it's a larger ongoing engagement uh, where, you know, you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year um, for localization. It's worth it. So you go to management, you show them some of the issues you're running with their product. Show them examples of their product. Don't show them generic examples. Show them examples of their product so they can relate to it. And um, and tell them all the problems these products are ca- these issues are causing and you know the cost. Uh, managers care about money and time, right? Mostly. Um, so and also resources, their resources. So you show them if you invest a little bit of your engineering time to fix these issues. Uh, your engineers will have to do a lot less work fixing bugs down the down the road where they have to put a custom fix in for weird internationalization issues they didn't fix up front. So I think the management buy-off is important. And then the other part is, like you said, engineers, you, you do some training with them, but use examples of their products that they relate to it. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the last, po- last podcast I was in, but um, some years ago, t- 10 years ago, so I was sent to Ar- Argentina to do some internationalization training for a, for a team. And... Um, and I wasn't sure, you know, what to expect from them. I didn't know the audience, didn't know the people well. It was a fairly new project I worked on. And, and so we decided we went down there and had a day to prepare. And we just took some screenshots with some explanations from their product. And it was one of the best internationalization training sessions I ever had because they were really interested. It was their product and we broke it for them. We showed them screenshots of things we broke. And they were really into it. We had good discussions about it. They really wanted to fix stuff because they really hated to see these things break. Um, so that's one of the most productive ways to do it. So don't give them some high-level abstract yeah. information. Go right to their product. Take some time to, to tear it apart and show them some issues. During, um, our, during our walkthroughs at Microsoft, um, because this was pre-released build, we could get, we could jump on builds at a certain point. So there's two things that tipped the, uh, tipped the equation. One of them is we made it mandatory for all the English-speaking feature teams to run pseudo mandatory, we could actually check it through telemetry if they were actually doing it. And once you had a high level of pseudo being used within the development process, a lot of the bugs started showing up a lot earlier because they were running their uh, tests on it and the developers were using it. And all of a sudden, all these issues would come up and you didn't even have to go over there and ask them to go fix something. Yes. And the second thing was during the walkthroughs, once you had localized build, we, we would pick two or three different languages. One of them was like Arabic. Um, I think we used um, probably Korean uh, and then uh, probably one of the European languages. And it wasn't me running through the UI. It was the actual feature PM installing these languages and running through them while the whole team is looking at it. And um, sometimes it was the first time that PM would, would even see the localized build. And we would actually have them walk through the, the, the functionality of, you know, installing a localized language on top of English, at, if that was a circumstance, and um, working with a different input language. And they would be hands-on and we would be right there next to them, just kind of cheering them on so that they can see the issues for themselves and take ownership of that. Often was the case where they thought they weren't the ownership. They, they weren't the right owners for localized builds, which is not the case if you design your engineering system properly yeah i think i think developers learn best on their like mistakes and pain so i think the Mm -hmm. best way to raise awareness is like give a developer an an app that's not internationalized and say now make it work in india 
And then, yeah. and then when they come back to you in tears, <laughs> you say, "Okay, <laughs> now, 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 develop something with internalization, internationalization in mind." So when you are actually writing code, and you think you have to, like, you have to already have this thought. There might be a date here. There might be that, this, and that. Um, or what I did. So how how I sort of tried to learn about internationalization. I developed my company's website, and I decided to internationalize it. And actually, while I was creating my HTML layouts, I would not even add any real life strings into into the HTML. I added like IDs, and then I connected the IDs with strings that were stored externally. And so, like this whole—I mean, it's a small website, but the whole logic behind it was like, okay, what if I needed to translate this into twenty languages, which I never did? But it was a really good exercise. Like, what is the most efficient way to have these strings? Um, you know, exported, translated, fixed. Maybe I need to revert to an older version. Um, and it was really, really interesting that like the whole software development was mm -hmm. um, was sort of centered around this idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The the human side of things is so important. It's not just about going in there and teaching them or telling them what to do and unblocking them. Probably the most important thing you can do is find the people who are a little bit naturally curious about these topics and start mentoring them because they're going to be your biggest advocates. That made my life so much easier because I worked in an organization like Windows, which is a few thousand people, and we had what we called world readiness tenant champions. And those were people inside the feature teams where we can pick up a phone and say, I need this bug looked at. And um, they weren't international people they, they they were they were people that we taught and mentored and so after a while they could you, you didn't even have to pick up the phone they would come to you and say we see this bug we're going to fix it you know i'm going to advocate this within the team that's what happens in large organizations i don't know how it works in smaller organizations but that's um, a solution to any problem it's like find somebody who's curious yeah, mentor yeah. them mentor them yeah. mentor them and they will become um um probably, you know, the best people within the organization to advocate and fix some of the issues or make sure they don't get introduced at all. You know, it's my favorite scenario is when a customer comes to me and says, hey, we have this application that we want to localize, um, want to work with you and get an estimate. And then we say, well, can you give us a, you know, an early copy of it so we can take a look at it and to say, no, it hasn't even been developed yet. That's my favorite, right? Because now you're in early, right? You got your foot in early before it's even ready. It's not even, mm -hmm. they didn't even have a, a running version yet. And then you can, you, so you can really start by talking about the things that need to be done early and get in with them early. And then another uh, opportunity is, that this just depends on the structure, right? If you're a vendor, a localization vendor, you may not be able to have that access, but see if you can get into their product development team meetings, PDT meetings or whatever they call them. Um, but ask them if they could just invite you that you can just listen in because you hear people talk about stuff and then you can pipe in when you hear something come up that requires some local uh, internationalization considerations. So I think find that really helpful. You know, it may be an hour a week of your time and you're like, oh well, yeah, another meeting, great, right? But it's so valuable. We've 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 made such a difference in some products with uh, being able to be there and immediately raising a flag when we see something. Because if you wait until it's in the build, it's too late, right? Then it's rework at that point. But if you raise it early when it, or, or um, if they have um, um, agile meetings, right? Where they, they look, discuss which new features to handle in the next sprint, stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. That's another good opportunity to to pipe in. Uh, reviewing their their product specs, um, their requirements documents. That's another thing we've done for some some um, uh, products, and we've been able to actually put internationalization in there as a feature that needs to be signed off on. Mm -hmm. And then for each feature, we identified some potential issues mm -hmm. uh, that. Um, so we had actual bullets in there for different features that were internationalization specific bullets. So those are some of the opportunities. Um, but you gotta, you know, you 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 want the person, the LE, whoever, whatever the person is, could be a solutions architect. You want them to be a person who can go to a, a meeting like that and speak up, right? So you want to have a communicator. You want to have a consultant type person. Um, you don't want to have the quiet person who doesn't speak up. That's not going to be very helpful. You know, they may be very knowledgeable, but they don't say anything. It's not going to do any good. Right. Um, so they have to be good at that. So pick a person 
that can do that. And I think you can make a huge difference right at the early in the process. We have a quick question that I think one of you can answer in a very few sentences because it's about the basic terminology. It's from Artem on Facebook. Can you tell me what is the difference among internationalization, localization, and transcreation? These terms are not the same, aren't they? So Let's take a stab at it. Yeah, the third one I don't know, but... Um, I know the third one. <laughs> internationalization is just, you can think about it as the engine in the, the plumbing. And uh, the second one was localization, right? Yes. And that's just, not just, but that's the equivalent of putting different language labels on instead of uh, the source language. Yeah, or additional adaptations too. For example, if you have a news feed, you want news that's local news, you have adaptation of a news feed or articles that are shown, that can be localization too. So adapting to for local usage. So translation is a big part of it, but there's some additional, additional mm -hmm. things. Internationalization is really what's going on in the background to make it all happen, right? Mm -hmm. And then the localization is the specific customization. So translation is part of localization, but mm -hmm. translation is not part of internationalization. The actual process of translation is not part of internationalization. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, last, the last term was actually transcreation, yes. not translation. But my yes. question for you, Bad, is, does internationalization always happen before you start a localization process or do you see it or can it also like run, let's say in parallel or maybe even afterwards? Well, mostly before. Uh, the more you can do it beforehand, the better. I mean, you're always going to have your, your internationalization hat on, right? Mm -hmm. But most of the things you'll find late in the process could have been um, uh, taken care of early. Uh, transcreation is basically when you don't just translate content from one language to the other, but you kind of rewrite it. So it's more, you know, marketing language, it's used a lot. I could, I would think that if you translate a book too, uh, if you translate a book, because you can't just, you know, if you do a very straight translation, it may not, like if it's a book that has a lot of emotion in it, for example, you'd have to read, write your sentences so that emotion is carried in that language. Um, you know, you can't just do a fairly straight translation as if the sentence, you have to kind of indulge yourself a little bit as a translator. And I think that's what transcreation is. Marketing materials too, you have to come up with slogans that, that work. Slogans, you can't just do straight translation. Um, so you have to be creative. It's that's creation. It's a creative part of the translation. Yeah, I think there's a, like a blurred line between localization and transcreation. And I would say uh, something like, translation of fiction it's like totally separate it doesn't really fit here because there's no like business aspect of it um translation of fiction it sort of needs to exist in in a different culture um but but you know it's literature transcreation it's it's not you're not really translating literature but you do need it to sort of resonate in a new culture um but then when you localize there are very very um many cases where you actually need to adapt like a name or something. And so that uh, that sort of smells like transcreation, but it's not considered that, right? Like, um, so I, I feel like um, transcreation and localization, they, they sort of coexist. And very often the translator will sort of, uh, um, will, you know, translate some strings, but actually transcreate other things. I have, I have a fine example if, if you want to analyze it um, for you. Yes. Um, so okay. So I just I just remember this from when I was a when I was a translator, and it really because I'm, I'm you know I can't even figure out uh, is it a problem with internationalization or or transcreation or whatever. So anyway, uh, when I was translating Google, um, the like Google stuff, uh, we uh, we got this string that was um, I don't know if it were if it was us maybe another team um, so that was like a countdown until uh, until Christmas for like for children so you could go on google maps and you can track santa and the string was you know santa is coming in 10 days and it was a countdown to to december 24th or 25th and somebody was translated it in translating it into ukrainian but the problem is in eastern europe we don't really have a santa claus and we don't celebrate christmas on 25th so we celebrated on uh, january 7. um but somebody and somebody tr so so the, the, the software, it was the same, right? Like the function that was displaying this Santa is coming, it stayed the same and it was counting down the days in the same way. 
Um, but we don't celebrate anything on December 25th. So it was like counting down to a non-existent holiday. But the, but the string was in Ukrainian and the, they, they transcreated or adapted uh, Santa Claus. They translated um, Ged Maroz, Ged Maroz. So this is for Russian speaking uh, people. Ged Maroz is like a father frost. It's like a, it's kind of like a Soviet creation, right? Like it's not even connected to any religion. And and this character, he's supposed to come on the New Year's. So it's like so all over the place because Santa is not translated correctly. It's not mm-hmm. the right date, but the software, it's like it keeps counting down days until the Catholic Christmas, which we don't celebrate here. So it's it's mm-hmm. a whole it's, it's it's such confusion because somebody tried to 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 transcreate the string and actually did apply a lot of creativity because they didn't use Santa Claus because they know that in, in Ukrainian culture we don't use Santa Claus. Um mm-hmm. But then there was so much over, like so much was overlooked, and I wonder if they could like run the same program, but before the New Year or before the Saint Nicholas Day that we have on December nineteenth or something like that. So it's, I think it's a very interesting case where everything is sort of intertwined, um, and and it became like a huge mess that nobody paid attention to, but I did, and I took a screenshot, <laughs> and then I went and then I went to a conference and I and I showed it on a slide, and I was like, this is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so at least I mocked because I was I was saying, you know, these processes, they are so, you know, they are so sort of stable and, and static and they but they cannot handle something as simple as Christmas. Right. And this is interesting because, um, you know, this is one aspect of internationalization maybe that we don't talk a lot about a lot. We talk more about the technical things, but um, recognizing content and recognizing this kind of an edge case, but it's it's a big one for that target audience, right? Because it's just going to be totally wrong. But um, um, recognizing the content that you're getting and what kind of treatment does it need from in regard to translation, thats I think that's an aspect of internationalization too. Um, I believe we got into this a little bit in the other podcast that I was in where about recognizing content automatically like is it marketing is it technical uh, because mm-hmm. you may use different translators it's an aspect of internationalization mm-hmm. uh, maybe not necessarily one that an le is involved in a localization engineer but maybe that can be the pm when they get a request they either clarify with the customer or they take a look at the source materials and make a determination what process do they use but it's it's still an aspect because if you pick wrong and you pick a very technical translator for something that needs some at least some amount of creativity maybe not quite transcreation but creativity you you know you're not going to have good results. I, I look at it from a more even higher level and say, why is so much of the internationalization um, knowledge passed from ear to mouth? Right? Like, why don't we have design tools today and development tools today that allow for any developer to just sit down and start writing something? but have the artificial intelligence to tell them, hey, we noticed you're shipping to this particular locale. You might want to pay attention to these things, right? Like have it a little bit context, uh, be context smart so that even if you don't have the knowledge or don't have somebody around you with the knowledge, you're able to make rather um, accurate decisions and not fall into all these problems time over time over time because we're seeing these things just come back. Yeah, wouldn't you love to see all the development environments having internationalization checks built in, for example? I mean, some probably do. I'm not a developer, so I don't really use the tools as as Mm -hmm. much as other people, but um, I know they, I know of companies like Microsoft have internationalization scanner type tools. Um, um, I forgot what, I don't know how good they were. There's also, there was Globalizer or is Globalizer still is a tool, a scan, it's code scanning tool, but it's totally separate. You have to, you know, you have to get a license for it and you can, um, you can integrate it into your development process, right? But then you have to work with the developers, you have to convince them to run the scans, you have to put it into the build process. And so it's a whole thing on top of everything and that there's often a lot of resistance for that. I think if it's built into the tool and you could yeah. just run it, you know, as part of your uh, Visual Studio yeah. or whatever, or uh, um, Xcode, whatever the, the, t- the tool is, I think it would be, got the, we would get a lot more usage. The, 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 the problems with scans, exactly what you said, the minute it's perceived as a tax, nobody wants to run it. Nice. The minute it's perceived as a tax, uh, people just just walk away from it if they right. can. And the other issue with these kind of scanning tools is that they don't 
replace good internationalization um, reviews. Yes, they don't. They're, they're one factor, yeah. They, they, they don't look at design the way a human eye uh, can look at design. And that's actually, if, if anybody's excited about going into the internationalization field, it's probably one of the most interesting areas because you look at everything. Yeah. I mean, end to end. Often was the case where I had to connect between different feature teams because I was seeing a user scenario that they were, you know, every, every one of them was so busy in their little box that they didn't realize that, you know, when you interact between the boxes, it's not a very good experience. Yeah. And that's where the internationalization experts come in and actually provide value. Um, oh, yeah, the, the scanning tools definitely don't replace it. I think they're one piece and they are useful in some areas. For example, hard coded strings, yeah. um, uh, string parsing, mm -hmm. um, um, not using, you know, like wide character um, functions, for example, things like that, mm -hmm. using old functions that do, um, you know, kind of Latin based string parsing, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so that they're useful, but there's another big problem with them false positives, right? Mm -hmm. So you run a scan and you get 10,000 errors. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. what are you going to do with that, right? I've worked with Globalizer for a while. And so you get this huge number. If you have a large project with, you know, hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of lines of code, you get tens of thousands of errors. Okay, now you got to whittle it down. Um, right. Now, this should ideally done by a developer who also has internationalization experience. Mm -hmm. I have internationalization experience. I'm not a developer. I don't recode very well. I read it a little bit, but the developer doesn't know the internationalization issue. So who's going to do the whittling down and writing regular expression to exclude certain things or, you know, change the rule set to adapt it to only catch valid issues? It could be a huge time sink, especially the first time you do it. Over time, it'll get better. You have a rule set developed that works, but yeah, they're really not. They they don't solve. The problem as as easily as they should. They're really not very usable. I think the intention is good, but I haven't seen a tool yet that makes it really easy. That's customizable enough that you can you only get you know the re, uh, as many relevant results, uh, like a high ratio of relevant to irrelevant mm -hmm. results. I, I yeah, well, the, go ahead. So that's the problem with artificial artificial intelligence is that internationalization is such a broad problem and mm -hmm. AI that we have right now can solve very specific problems. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it just, it gets, it gets too complicated. That's why you get so many false positives, which is good news because it doesn't look like um, international internationalization will get solved uh, anytime soon. So, you know, it, the specialists in that area will be very valuable. Um, because yeah, it's just, it's too, it's too much to account for. And I don't think it comes down to just, you know, are your dates, you know, uh, replaceable or whatever. Do you, mm -hmm. do you check for the locale? I didn't, it's not that simple at all. And I think you get, you get too, like too many edge cases and too many examples, like with that one with Christmas. <clears throat> yeah. Yet though, AI could be an opportunity to make better tools, um, AI. that, that can do more context based, you know, evaluation of issues. The, the one thing that, that I'm hearing now when I say, you know, I hate these scanning tools because they they lean into the thought that internationalization is a checkbox that the developer looks at and scans something and then ships it out and says, yeah, it ran. All the false positives were false positives and we're all good. And and it doesn't it doesn't take care of the entire ecosystem that produces this product. Right. It doesn't talk about the designers. It doesn't talk about the testers. It doesn't talk about the user experience researcher. It doesn't talk about any of that. And the, the poor developers, I mean, often is the case where they get stuck with this check mark and they have some program manager sitting there telling them, hey, did you run these scans? And then they do. And then they, they're all good, right? They, they high five and go home. <laughs> and, uh, well, well and you, let's say you tell a developer you have to externalize all hard-coded hard strings into a resource file. Right, that they say, okay, I'll be done in a week. I'll come back to you. So they come back to you, give you this resource file. It has a huge number of strings in it, and half of them are not localizable strings. They're not meant to be. They're not right. seen. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, we forgot to tell you that only externalized strings that are actually seen by the user that we're going to need to translate. You know, yeah, right. you want to leave hard code. <laughs> now we have to mark all those as not translatable in the resource file or within our translation tool, and, and, and it, it creates a whole new set of problems. So that's you know not enough. Education or thinking 
we weren't specific enough. We just told them to go solve this problem. I think the development process is fairly straightforward compared to designers. User experience, uh, which is you know human interaction design, which is a, a thing that's keep, uh, grown up in the last five years or so, maybe a little bit more, um, hasn't had um, the growing pains of internationalization. Often was the case in Microsoft where I was surprised how the design team wasn't aware that localization internationalization should be part of their daily thought. You know, they would polish the English UI to the end of pixels. And then when they would see the localized UI, they thought, oh, we just pass that along to the localization team and they do all the magic. You know, and 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 that's where you have to work hard. I think the designer discipline and the designer tools could offer so much more to internationalization and than they do today. Yeah, you know, it's interesting actually. I was just thinking about the ad adapting the UI for you know translation. They they made it perfect in English, right? So in the really good old times, good old times or bad old times, when we had an English DLL and it had, uh, you know, 20 years ago, it had dialogues in it with strings in it. So you'd actually, you know, all Windows style um, a UI mm -hmm. resource files. So you could actually translate and then you can go make the buttons bigger and make the text box bigger. And you actually have every, because every language has a DLL. And so every dialogue exists for every language and you right. can go adapt. It's a lot of work, but you have full control. So as a localizer, I loved it because I have full control over everything. I can do whatever. I can make the dialogue bigger in some cases, unless it's a modal dialogue or if it's a within mm -hmm. some kind of restrained, constrained environment. But in some cases I can actually make things bigger so I can make it perfect, just like they made the English perfect. It's a lot of work if you have 25 languages and, you know, 500 dialogues. It's a lot of work. And then they redesigned the English and then how are you going to, you know, redesign right. it? Then it becomes messy. So there's actually, I, it's not a good design, but from a localization point of view, um, you get control. Nowadays, usually you have a, a one-size-fits-all design or, or a, 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 a neutral, a language-neutral UI. Mm -hmm. And then you have the strings in the string table, right? You know, whatever, ResX file, for example. Mm -hmm. And then they get, you know, the UI gets populated. So there you have to, uh, you know, you polishing the English version just to make it perfect for English or the source version, whatever the language that is, is not necessarily the right way to do it. Um, mm -hmm. You you want to design a UI, but so oh, this is another thing, right? So you go to the, to the, to the, to the development team and say, well, you got to leave space for us. We need space, right? So, but then they make an ugly source UI with a lot of empty space everywhere. <laughs> Um, right. And it doesn't look good, so that's not doesn't solve the problem either. So you have to find a way to have an appealing uh, UI in all languages, and, and that's mm -hmm. actually tricky. And you know, there are things you can do with some some dynamic um, uh, ways of, of formatting things. You can bump up so for a language like Chinese, where you tend to be shorter and strings we, are shorter, you can bump up the font size a couple we, points, which is better that. anyway, right? And it fills out the UI better, so. When we were developing Windows 8 and developing the tiles, um, that was the exact problem that we were facing because the designers took English to the pixel level and then we brought in some of the uh, Asian languages and the developer was just sitting there, you know, in shock and the designer didn't know what to do and then they had to go and redesign everything. So that exactly, you find that right portion that is something that a developer in a subject matter expert shouldn't be dealing with. Like that is really a design job. Like, I don't know proportions. I don't know how fonts should look like, but you know, that's something that somebody goes and becomes a designer for. Right. Um, and so again, bringing in the designer is such a, is such a instrumental thing to do and having them part of the story, is such a, a, a strong foundation for building something that's a lot more, sustainable and rich and uh and inclusive um by the way uh you, you you made me laugh with the dll story where you could resize everything so for a while in in if you're dealing with hebrew and arabic the localization team could mirror the ui or the developer could mirror the ui and 
you'd get situations where we'd have a mirroring bug and the localization team would fix it and the developer team would fix it and then they would break it again. <laughs> it would just go back and forth. <laughs> yes. You finally have to pick up a phone and do a conference call and say, you fix it, you don't touch it. <laughs> That's, that's fun. You know, I need to go on a very little rant because there was a little while ago that tiles became a thing. We put everything into these tiles, into these rectangular things. And what I've seen a lot is there's a title of some, you know, there's content in there and there's a title. And the title is the most important part. And it's only they only give you one line and they do dot, dot, dot at the mm -hmm. end and it's it's the worst thing you can imagine it's like how is this even even in the source language it's it's just from a ux point of view it's just horrible <laughs> why do you do this and then you translate it it gets twice as long so you have even less visible text and it's totally unusable and you have even even i i remember a web application where we had two tiles next to each other and they started with the same text and the differentiating part of the sentence was at the end and they were both cut off in the same place and so they said the same thing you didn't know what to click you know stuff like that just drives me crazy it's like who looks at this even you don't even have to know internationalization who looks at this in the source and says oh this is great you know right. but it you know we do we do uh localization le le's or or um, people who do the con the the consulting with customers should really have some ui knowledge um mm -hmm. some usability ux knowledge because you're you become much better consultant if you if you have that kind of angle um, as part of your expertise, for sure. I want to go back to our chat. We have a question from Julia from Shopify. Are gender inclusive solutions such as something something? I think the link that you pasted was probably blocked and replaced by an asterisk or similar impacting accessibility. And how would you solve that? So we don't know what solution she was referring to. Maybe Julia, if you're still with us, you can maybe type the name of the solution. But how would you guys think about gender inclusiveness when it comes to internationalization? Like for example, let's let's talk about Spotify since Julia is from Spotify, right? You have a user who logs in. Maybe do you want to greet them in their gender that they selected somewhere in the user profile? And is, is it this, interesting? and is this part of internationalization? <laughs> yeah, it, this, go ahead, Oksana. There's actually, uh, it's a good point. I wouldn't call it gender inclusivity. I would call it like language inclusivity because um, when, it, when it sort of uh, comes to synthetic languages where the gender is expressed in, in a word, like in several words, um, it becomes more complex because you can't just like there is no a neutral way to say something you have to use masculine because mm -hmm. it's a tradition um and i think um when you I, I am not sure if that's internationalization but it's definitely mm -hmm. like localization prep um mm -hmm. it, it's yeah it's connected to it so you you get these like placeholders and the translator can do several strings uh, and they can they can express the same thing in masculine um and feminine way when like if if we want to to expand this to a hundred genders as <laughs> as it is the the um the mode right now i i don't think it's very i don't think it's very uh, practical i think um in localization you still stick to two genders unfortunately um but yeah we just have we just basically uh, give the translator several options and then and then on the software side you just check um, what was the gender of that particular user, and based on that variable, you will display a particular string. Um, but if any, but that's that's just localization side. But if, if, please, please, somebody add add to that. I, I, it's so twenty years ago. I don't know if you got the chance to listen to our previous interview. Me and Andre discussed this. Um, wh why give the localizer one option? Why are we just translating to one version of a language? Why not have the ability to translate to masculine or feminine form on different resources why doesn't why don't we see this in most platform where they allow you to have more than one version of a language you know facebook for example even i think facebook is translated to all kinds of different languages including pirate english right and so why can't i have hebrew masculine form and hebrew feminine form and then if i'm a user and i select hebrew feminine form then all the UI strings are translated to feminine form. Um, 
that's a very inclusive design, but the, the platforms just don't allow it today. And so this is exactly where we as an industry have to realize where the bottlenecks are. This is a demand that has to go to the platform level, whether it's Microsoft or Google or Facebook or Amazon or Apple. And we have to demand that they allow us to, to have more than one version of a language so that we're, you said it right, Oksana, you said this is being language inclusive. It's not about feminine, masculine, for example. Maybe Japan wants to have a version of the language that allows children to read the UI uh, because they're not able to read the UI today. So you want to have Japanese for children. You know, or they may have like different levels of politeness. Like maybe you want Facebook to be like really uh, respectful to you, or maybe you want it very, um, you know, casual. You, you may even want to get to the point where you have um, for if you're shipping um, Apple, if Apple was shipping their iOS to businesses and they have a professional translation and they also have the casual translation for the home users, right? And you want to be able to be, you, you, you nailed it. You said language inclusive. You want to be language inclusive to the point where you're able to uh, have a broader reach and allow for somebody, if the company doesn't want to do it, but allow somebody to crowdsource or do whatever to make sure that they're able to produce a secondary version or a third version or whatever of a language so that the platform supports it and we're able to do this. But, but we as an industry have to realize where the bottlenecks are. And today that is the bottleneck. If you want to install more than one version of a language, most likely there's a bottleneck there on the platform level. And we as an industry have to demand that that bottleneck gets removed. Yeah, and a couple of points to add there. I think um, like internet in general is very much centralized in English. And English mm -hmm. is a very sort of specific language and it's what I would call as a linguist analytical language. And it means that like a verb only expresses the action and let's say the tense. It doesn't express anything else. In Ukrainian, mm -hmm. the verb will also express the gender. So you can you can create a very neutral UI in English that doesn't require any kind of gender inclusivity because it would just be gender inclusive just mm -hmm. by the nature of the English language. But then when you try to translate it, there is no way. I mean, I could go around it, like could just neutral word is gonna sound really weird. Um but there is no other way uh, than to use, you know, masculine everywhere, which is really annoying. Um, mm. I, what was the other point I wanted to make? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. But but if you use masculine, it at least will look fine. But there are other problems um, that, like, outside of gender. For instance, something like numbers. If English has only two forms of nouns that are used with numbers, like you have, you say, like one mm. order, two orders, like you have singular and plural in ukrainian you will have a different um a different form of a noun for different numbers you will have a different form for one two then five is a different form 15 is a different form and mm -hmm. for that that was a really big pain um because we had to either like come up with something that looks really really strange or demand that we have like six forms um and then and then they are six forms of the, of the noun translated and then they are dependent on the number that is used and mm -hmm. it's really complicated because google when i was translating google they kind of handled it but they handled it incorrectly because even like the ukrainian person that did that they missed some some like parts of of, of the ukrainian language um mm -hmm. and it's still in like it still looked weird at the end so you mm -hmm. really need to think about it uh, and think about the different type languages that you work with. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's all because English is so different and neutral that we get these problems at the end. That that's exactly the mind state where we as an industry have to walk away from and say, why are we living by the limitations of the source language, right? Where where are these bottlenecks that we can identify and say this is you know this is a bottleneck that was created because we're living with the rules of the source language? How do we break free? How do we create something that's bigger, that's scalable, that works for more locales? And then you know the the minute you break away from the source language, in many cases is English, you're able to see the design very clearly and where where it's suffering and where it's not you know handling things correctly. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. There's always two there are two approaches, I think, you know, with when it comes to gender. 
um, or plurals, uh, plural forms. Um, plural forms, I mean, that issue has been there forever, right? That's been an internationalization issue that we run into a lot with, with mm -hmm. Russian and other languages. Um, but, so th there are two approaches. Either you fully accommodate it by accommodating all the potential plural variations for all the languages and countries, or you just avoid it, right? If you can avoid, avoiding it sometimes works well. So, um, for example, um, instead of five files, it says files, colon, and then a number, right? That's a still weird. Well, it depends. In a technical context, you know, um, hard drives, um, uh, partitions, and then the colon number in a technical user interface, that's totally fine. That's actually better to separate the number visually mm -hmm. from the words. Um, that's for an engineer, that's much more appealing. It's, it's depends. So that depends on the application, which way you choose depends on the application, but sometimes avoidance is the best solution. Same with gender, right? In a, in a technical application, you know, you, there's no need to, to, address the person in a way where gender matters. Um, you know, take gender out of it when you can, but in certain applications where it's a very personal experience, mm -hmm. um, for example, a dating application, it might be really important, right? Mm -hmm. So there you have to have the full ability for the user, the user has to be able to choose because in the end, if you assume something about the user, you'll make it worse, right? So you can't, um, um, uh, you know, on the gender front, you have to allow the user to make the choice and then have the application properly handle it. Um, um, the in internationalization's job is just to, to, to allow it, right? To create the infrastructure to make it possible. Like you said, why can't we have a formal and an informal version of Japanese for Windows, Windows OS? What if I want to use a, a more colloquial, informal? Uh, it's just a sub language. It should just be a sub language, right? It's just a matter of creating the infrastructure for it. And then it can be translated into 100 different variations of Japanese. You could do a Swiss German in 15 different dialects. I mean, it'd be awesome, actually, because we. We have literally about 15 different dialects in Switzerland, even though we're a really small country. Um, so it's that's not hard to accommodate. Um, mm -hmm. From a technical point of view, it's not hard to accommodate. Um, I actually so. um, because 20 years ago when I was at Microsoft and I raised the idea of having a, I called it the gender interface pack, which was the ability to localize into uh, feminine form, um, the resource loader couldn't do it. It wasn't the localization that was the problem. It was just the resource loader couldn't have another language that was Hebrew, right? Because it wasn't it wasn't designed for it. But it, right. designing for it probably wouldn't be that hard. I mean, especially with Windows, you have so much legacy stuff in there yeah, now. Yeah. I think they're trying to shed a lot of that now. Um, I notice over every generation they're trying to shed some legacy support. But you know, there's still a lot of legacy support for the command line. The, the, the one thing that bothers me with um, and you know, we, we said you know you can you can um, you can localize so that it sounds better that so that it works. Imagine all this machine translation and text prediction and technologies that are trying to learn how we translate and how we type. And if we're doing all these workarounds, what is the machine learning about us? Right. Oh, yeah. It's so. Yeah. Go ahead. So that was my uh, research paper when I was when I was in college. Uh, I was uh, because I was studying translation, right? So there was no tech uh, in my in my uh, particular um, major, but I was actually writing a research paper on how how these restraints affect how we sort of um, change the language. And I was saying the Ukrainian language was becoming like we were abandoning a lot of the forms; so it was becoming less synthetic, which mm. which is not nat natural. So so yeah. if you actually like grab all of these strings. Um, exactly. Video and I translated for Google and tried to train some machine translation on it. It's not going to be a good reflection of how people actually speak. So, you know, internet is influencing how we use the language um, very Amazing. much. That's, uh, as, as the committee chairman at the Standard, Standard Institute of Israel, one of my goals is to preserve the language and not allow yeah. for, you know, we're very concerned with like machine translation coming in from a vendor that isn't going to, you know, because it's a small market, is, isn't going to invest very much. And just throw something in there, and then you know, give it give it a few years, and, and then it starts influencing the language. And we're not saying the language shouldn't evolve, but it should evolve naturally. Exactly. Yeah. Right. 
Um, I'm all for evolution, and, and I think that's something you don't stop. You you actually have to encourage, but you want to make sure that it's encouraged in the right spots. And having some external vendor that's going to uh, provide machine translation and not do a very good job could really harm the ecosystem. Uh, and so that's why I'm concerned when we do all these workarounds that eventually it's going to cause bigger damage. Yeah, I'll give you another annoying example so when i was translating for blah blah car and blah blah car is supposed to be like it's a it's a ride sharing company and it's supposed mm-hmm. to be like very sort of bright and sort of playful because it's mm-hmm. it's focused on like building community and on trust because you're going to be driving with somebody you don't know so it has mm-hmm. to be like very sort of uh you know um casual and one of the strengths that i had to translate all the time like it would come up all the time would be something like you are driving with and the name of the user and I guess it worked. I guess they fo- they were focusing on the source language um, French, right? Because it's it's a it's a French startup. I guess it works in French and it works in English really well. But when you give me that string without like any, I don't even I don't even not even internationalization could save it because I need to somehow take this unknown name of the user and change its form. Um, you know, the form of the noun, because we've, we we have forms of names as well and forms of less names in Ukrainian. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, and it's, we are already um, sort of abandoning certain forms of nouns in Ukrainian um, due to like the Soviet Union and, all, and all, a lot of stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. And it's like very kind of painful culturally for us. And now you're also, you know, you're also telling me translate this in a way that the noun is like, you know, nominal noun nominal form of the noun um mm. and so then the sentence is really awkward and there is absolutely no way for me to change the sentence or if mm. i if i try to do it as if you know like the computer is speaking to you like ai is speaking to you the name of your driver is then <laughs> then then the you know the message of blah blah car is not being um transferred yeah. and then you you're receiving this email and it's not that playful as it as like mm. the designers wanted it to be so mm. like even to me it's like you had to redesign how the how these notifications are formulated from scratch like maybe even i don't know for all languages it had to be redesigned mm-hmm. would have to be because it never was right like i did my best but i didn't i never liked it um yeah so and i think it's a big impact on on small mm-hmm. la- languages That's that classic, uh, classic case of too late right like hey we sent this out to localization and everybody came back and said we can't do it and then you have to go and redesign and rebuild or, or yeah yeah exactly but they didn't rebuild like we we you know if you don't rebuild it it's going to mm-hmm. influence the culture that that your app exists in mm-hmm. um in some in, in some small ways but if we have a thousand apps that are influencing in a small way then you're going to have a big impact um yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think some of those internationalization issues, like the example I just mentioned, you don't even see them until the person, you know, who speaks the language actually looks at it. Because, I mean, anytime you have string concatenation, it's a red flag, right? If you try mm-hmm. to put a name into a sentence programmatically, a person's name um, or a, a person's role or a whatever, um, anything that, that it requires some adaptation, Um but as an engineer, you'd see it as a flag and say, okay, we need to see if this works. And if it does work, we need to tell the translator to what the, what the variable is going to be replaced with at runtime so they can translate it properly. Maybe that will work. But again, you know, some of it you may not, until the linguist looks at it, it may not, you may not even realize this is just not going to work. And I've seen some pretty horrendous stuff there. Um, I, I want to, I don't know how, Time, but um, I mean, think I think one thing we should talk about a little bit is so what if we can? We talked a lot about upstream, how we can influence development teams and um, you know management teams and and creators of of content or, or software. But exactly. what if you don't have that control? What if you're a localization vendor? You work maybe you know even large companies that create a lot of content and give it to a vendor. They don't often don't create the content themselves anymore. They outsource that too, so they have marketing vendors. Create Creating marketing materials for them, um, it happens a lot. Uh, more, maybe uh, it, it, at least in my environment, it's more common than not. Um, that um, or maybe the content is created, but you written by somebody at the at the company you do the work for. But then the the you know they give it to a DTP person, they outsource the DTP because they don't have their own DTP people. Um, so um, 
you get you have these additional contributors who you don't even know who the person is. The person you're talking to at your customer side is not the person who's going to DTP. They give it to a vendor, and there they have probably a rotating set of DTP people, right? Who just take stuff, format it, and hand it back to you. So you really don't have the opportunity to educate anybody on internationalization sometimes. You just don't. Mm -hmm. They don't even give you access to those people. So mm -hmm. that's still a problem, right? So now we, as the event, as the localization company, get all this content that has all these issues. What can we do? Because we still have cost pressures, right? We, we're asked to do things cheaply and fast. You know, what can we do um, to 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 make things better to for ourselves so we don't spend so much time manually redoing things and fixing internationalization issues? Um, just and I give guess up. It's I give up, just, give up, just <laughs> let garbage in, garbage out, flip, right? Flip, so, flip the table. Well, I, you know, garbage in, garbage out is a concept. I don't like it, but we've done it. You know, it, we've had cases where it's like nobody wants to take a stab at making it better. Mm -hmm. There's no time budget um, to to really improve it much unless mm -hmm. we just eat the time. Um, and nobody you know, sees if, right. nobody sees the improvements because the client doesn't speak the five languages that you are translated into. They don't right. care whether you know it sounds good or not. It's, well, it's all yes. things to them yeah. literally. <laughs> and and well, there may not be any quality control on their side either. We just throw it back at them when it's translated. And they just do with it whatever they want to do. Right? They publish it, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so yeah, they may not even know. I mean, you know, but we hate doing a bad job. So we'll figure out a way to make it better anyway, right? Um, but um, so, you know, you look for opportunities for automation, for can we write some scripts that find certain issues? So we do quite a bit of that. Uh, in, in it's, it's nice in Adobe applications, you have extensive scripting abilities. Uh, Microsoft mm -hmm. tools have VB uh, mm -hmm. scripting abilities. So you can actually do a lot of cool stuff. Uh, PowerPoint is one of those um, applications. You know, it's an awful application. Uh, I think we all agree it's just awful. It can do it's, but it's great for just throwing something together real quick, right? It's it's great for grabbing it, put together some. How much of Microsoft Design was done in PowerPoint? So I would get UI mockups of the English, whatever they were trying to build, and and they would ask me, hey, how do you mirror this or that? And I said, just give me the PowerPoint file, and I'd return it mirrored. And they would sit there for a moment and say, thanks, and go and build it, right? And so PowerPoint is great for that. <laughs> uh, PowerPoint is great for a lot of things. For localization, right. it's really just yeah. kind of a nightmare because it has such poor facilities. Have you tried to search for a soft return, like a soft line break in PowerPoint? You can't do it. Right. It doesn't even have an advanced find feature. Um, right. um, and so, so getting stuff ready... Uh, PowerPoint, you really have to write some scripts, and I think it's well worth it to develop some simple scripts that can find all your um, manual line breaks, for example, and then you can decide to take them out if they're mid-sentence, right, as part of uh, file preparation. Um, uh, stuff like fonts, um, you know, you can, you can, uh, I found a tool that went through a Word document and just enumerates all the fonts used in the document. And I run it on this document. There's like 20 fonts used. It's like, why are they using 20 different fonts? And so, you know, it's an easy, easy way to clean. And you can search for the fonts and clean it up. Mm -hmm. So yeah. th th there's so many great opportunities to do that when you, when you can't push it back to the creator of the content. Well, so one of the things, in, as you're talking, I'm thinking is, uh, and, and I don't know if this exists today, but as localization vendors, if you had a centralized, marketplace where a client could approach the marketplace and say i'd like you know this content localized but before they submit it it goes through kind of like the app store it goes through a check and then the automatic check says hey you know if you fix this and that that's going to save you money and make the localizer a lot happier um then that might bring value both for the localizer and the client and uh and kind of fix some of those problems but you really do need like a central hub or a central marketplace for that to happen. I've always wondered if you can monetize internationalization tools. I mean, you know, there are some out there, like we talked about globalizer, things like that. But, mm -hmm. but internationalization tools like scripts for pre-processing InDesign files or Illustrator, there are some tools out. There's some string extraction tools. There's some plugins for Adobe. So mm -hmm. there's some out there, but I have a feeling none of them make a lot of money for the people who created them. You know, SDL, if you go to, Trados has, has plugins, right? Um, 
did, and I, I look through there and it seems like they either don't get a lot of usage or they get really bad reviews or so it's not a very vibrant um, marketplace in that sense and maybe it's just because the industry is too small you know well, it's just you know, I, I think it, it really comes down to the fact that okay it's kind of like using like if you're a handyman um, and you were building uh, installing a bookshelf and uh, you could use a drill from Ikea or you could drew, use a drill from like a professional drill maker, right? And that's the difference, right? Like the professional drill is just going to drill through that wall and make sure everything is right. And the Ikea one might not even get through the concrete. Um, sorry, Ikea, nothing personal. <laughs> uh, love you. Um, but um, the, the thought is, is are the design and development tools today integrating that professional level drill into their uh, environment so that people don't have to think about what kind of drill they're using, right? They already know they're using the best drill out there. Are you going to invest as a professional in the best tools out there? You probably are, right? And, and whoever is able to not just have these patches of internationalization, but have a very cohesive system, engineering system, is, is going to do everybody a, a, a huge favor and, uh, and, and start you know, dealing with internationalization in a more uh, robust way. But how many tools have really solid internationalization facilities, localization facilities built in? <laughs> Few, right? I mean, go, let's say people use Drupal for uh, hosting their website, right? And says, oh, it's, mul it's multilingual, can we build this built in? There's so many issues with Drupal and localization. Um, you know, if you do some super standard stuff, I think it works really well. But mm -hmm. Drupal, you can add all these modules and then you add all these modules to create your content a certain way. And then none of those modules are internationalized. The whole thing yeah. just blows up in your face. Yeah. Uh, so Drupal is a really is an extreme example because of all the contributed modules um, that, you know, not part of core Drupal that you can add and internationalization is a total crapshoot there. So you can really blow up your site if you have an already localized site and you start adding some modules so you can do some cooler stuff with your content, you may just totally break localization. Um, mm -hmm. I've literally worked on a project where that was the case, where we had an automated process for localization. They did some stuff, they customized some stuff, and it just blew up everything. We had to do everything yeah. man manually after that, and nobody planned around it, and <laughs> nobody talked to us about it. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, and we already mentioned like how many levels and parts does internationalization have? It would be very hard to come up with a design for a tool that would handle all of that. You can handle maybe like one uh, facet of that, um, but then I think it's it's like enough to be an actual business and be useful um what i just thought about was it would be really cool if if you could like convert your html files into internationalized html files or something like that mm -hmm. um but again it's only one part one little part of internationalization so i don't think i don't think you know you i don't think it's it's feasible to apply some very effective ai or or um or uh you know some technology um, to that problem. I think it's a very much human problem, you know. One well, of so human many task. file formats, right? There's so many file formats these days. And it's what's actually made it more difficult. So in the old times, you had pretty much you'd work with local files, right? To Word documents, mm -hmm. Excel files, PowerPoint, InDesign, mm -hmm. Photoshop. Now you have so much more um, SaaS tools, right? So there, you just go to your browser, you just run the tool, you create the design, you export to whatever format you want, but the source design is not even an editable file that you download to your desktop and work on. It's just up in the cloud, stored in your project. Um, so, and so if that tool doesn't have internationalization built, you're totally out of luck. You can't even manipulate the file. I mean, at least in PowerPoint, I can go and, and you know, I have scripting. I have a lot of capabilities to manipulate my content, but mm -hmm. uh, with stuff that literally exists entirely in the cloud and it's just locked into that application that you're using online, it's actually more difficult. If they're not properly internationalized, they're unusable for localization. We had mm -hmm. a customer come to us with, we were supposed to localize some designs they're doing and in the end, we realized the only way to do it is to just clone the design and then paste in all the translations wow. um, and then do a little bit of layout change. There was no way to export the text, export in some format that supported localization. So we just had 
to tell them this. The only way to do it is fully manually, and it's going to cost you know a million dollars or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. It wasn't a million, but um, uh, it, it, it's incredibly frustrating that we're actually going backwards in some areas. Um, yeah. Right. Um, right. Because I feel like Microsoft, for example, has actually they put a lot of focus on internationalization. They really, I, I think they do. They could probably do more, but I, I know like Windows, for example, if you looked at their, you know, they have pretty significant operation to, to create the localized versions, right? Relatively yeah. speaking. I, I've been, I've been expressing quite a bit my frustration with regressions over the last few years. And I'm well, maybe they're cutting, yeah. I've been, <laughs> I've been very, I, I, I'm very accurate about my, assessment of when things regress because I, I know that product very well. Um, the issue is, again, we go back and forward, right? Like the minute we're able to make some sort of advancement, that's where people often stop and then a few years go by and then we realize again that we're not up to speed. And Oksana, you made a great point. Like it's very difficult to have one solution fix it all, right? And I, I agree because it's a multi-dimensional problem. It's the platforms, the operating systems that have to get updated that haven't been updated in a while in, in certain areas. Um, it's the design tools that just don't provide a good solution. It's the developer environments that need to be looked at. And, um, and I think uh, the user experiences which just keep evolving User experience doesn't care. User experience keeps evolving. And, and if the platform doesn't support it, tools don't support it, um, that's a problem. So I think it's a huge mistake to say, hey, our problem got bigger, so there's no way we can fix it. We need to start pushing on the solution side and not just mapping the, the, the side of the, the, the problem. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I think I think a big part of this is connected to um, in some way to like standards and protocols because we were saying like there are so many ways to do this and so many formats and and, and blah blah blah. Um, mm -hmm. I am a big proponent on like doing everything in JSON. Just if you if you are sending data, if you are inputting data, if you are pasting mm -hmm. something, make sure you can just do it in JSON because mm -hmm. I think that that is something that will be around for a long time. Uh, and if you can, even even if your framework is old or something like that, mm. find a way where you can easily, where it's so flexible, especially if the strings are so flexible that you can just like grab them from from a JSON. And I, I would like the whole translation industry, localization industry. Uh, mm. I think we are very heavy on XML. Uh, the, I, I would like us to switch to that because I feel like it would really help with um, even with internationalization as well. Yeah, we definitely see it more and more, which is a good thing. Um, There's I one more question, guys, because we're yeah. already 90 minutes in. Uh, just to quickly check, Beth, are you still good for one question? Yes, I'm good. Yes, okay. <laughs> so the final question that we had from chat uh, from Tamara on Facebook. Hi, great topic. Thanks for the discussion. My question. If internationalization is very well done, is it an option not to test the localized version? How does internationalization affect software testing? Wow. Um, never, ever, ever set something out of the market without looking at it. Um, the, the, the nastiest bugs I've seen is that when you, know, when you translate, for example, to Hebrew or Arabic and the UI looks like it was um, rearranged correctly from right to left, you quickly find out that like the input gestures or the ink is inputted in mirrored form. So like you press on the left side of the of the screen and you actually see the click on the on the left side. <laughs> so the functionality is broken. I, I'd never ever send a product out to any market without looking at it. Yeah. 
on the other hand, and I think the point is, it's actually a really good question because I think you can save money if you internationalize, have internationalize well. That's mm-hmm. the whole point. You still have mm-hmm. to do some validation, but let's say you do a validation and you really have a product that's, you know, you're continuously localizing. You've been localizing for years mm-hmm. and you've improved internationalization. You will be able to cut down your QA cycles over time because you'll find less, less bugs. Right, you'll have less bugs, so you have less iterations of QA. So you're going to save money. Yes, you you never send anything out without um, at least some some QA. Also, even in the best process, new issues are introduced. They add a new feature. One developer doesn't have all the information about proper internationalization. They they introduce a new bug. So you know, as a project as a, as a, uh, a product evolves, there will be new issues. So you, 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 there's no perfection in internet. You have to be vigilant. You have to constantly check for internationalization uh, up front. Hopefully you won't find it in, in QA. Hopefully you find it in you know pseudo localization testing or, or other places. But no, yeah, you're always going to do QA, but you could reduce it in a well, uh, you know, kind of if you have a well-run machine, you mm-hmm. could reduce and probably save quite a bit of money on localization QA if you do it well. Yeah, I, I agree that you're going to save a lot of time and money, but also like from the linguistic uh, perspective, um, you, you still should do QA in like in the UI because mm-hmm. like sometimes the translation won't make sense and it's not any, like it's not anyone's fault. It's just the context, um, wasn't there or something like that. Uh, and then that, that is good to catch and sort of send back the translation. For me, one of the things that I, I, when I heard that statement, it just, it doesn't sit well because I say, you know, then why don't you release English out without checking it and go ahead and like work on Spanish or something like how, how would that make you feel like it, it, imagine if English was the source language for that particular application you're releasing and you also translated it to 20 other languages. Why, why do you even bother checking English? Like if, if something's going to go wrong, it's probably with the other languages. English is going to be fine. Um, and so the other thing every organization has to be cognizant about is we, we touched on this last time, Andre, was that unconscious cultural bias. Like, how do you make sure that you're treating bugs on the localized product the same as they were on the English bill? So let's say you had like on the main UI, you had some string clipping. You know, you'd never send English out the door with that. But if it was like the French product, you say, hey, we're going to wait to see if the market has any feedback on it, right? Like, how do you make sure that you don't roll quality assurance into the customer's hand because you're trying to save money on localization and then you're creating this unconscious cultural bias in your development process where the international user is receiving a product that has less quality built into it? And it's not just the language testing, too. We haven't really talked about internationalization testing so much. I think that's a whole separate expertise, area of expertise. Somebody who can take a product and really run it through all the paces. We had a some obscure bug in one product. I think it only came up once. I think he's muted. In um, Yeah, I think I hit a key. Um, in Persian, there is a delimiter um that i think it's a delimiter i don't remember the exact case but there's some kind of delimiter that's unusual it's like a slash or something and it created you know a a failure in the product but it's it's such an edge case because who had the system set to persian you know if we don't even translate into persian um um, or whatever, you know, we, we don't even look at that setting because we're doing, you know, German, French, Italian, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese. So we're not even testing with those language settings. Um, mm-hmm. And so in some rare case, somebody just accidentally did it and stumbled across it. We don't do enough of that in my book um, mm-hmm. um, to just, you know, test across all the different cultures and settings, even if it's not localized into that language. I think there's mm-hmm. another area where Probably a lot of bugs slip through and mm-hmm. people run into it and end users run into it. We never caught it. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that could could use more focus too. Yeah, the, yeah, o- always test. To add to that language bias, uh, it's, it's not unrelated to the question, <laughs> but uh, it like really triggered me. <laughs> because, <laughs> Great. Yes, I have another follower. <laughs> yeah, something <laughs> like... Sorry, something like nationalizing the world here. 
<laughs> yes, yes, exactly. I was going to put uh, translate like a meme, translate everything uh, on on my screen, but you couldn't see it. So anyway, anyway, so here's the story. Something like Airbnb, like big, huge websites like Airbnb, it's it's uh, localized into Russian, but not into Ukrainian. But they made this development decision to show the Russian interface when the locale is Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I feel like it's a really bad po like political decision because like mm -hmm. they made it in whatever 2018 after all of this, all of these conflicts happened. And to me, it's like, well, wait, you can't pay a translator to translate this into Ukrainian then, I don't know, show it in English or something. Like, what is what is this assumption that, yeah, I, I am fluent in Russian, but what is this assumption that I want to see um, a website in Russian mm -hmm. in, in my country? Like, what, right. what do you think? How do you think people are going to feel? And, mm -hmm. you know, who made this decision and how much money did it save you? And it's, mm -hmm. I feel like it's so kind of insensitive. Uh, but I, 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 I'm sure, like, it wasn't anything malicious. It was just like, you know what? This market is small and it's not bringing us that much profit. <laughs> It's um, different. Yeah. yeah. Um, for a lot of these companies have, and, and you actually brought a great point, being intentional about going to a market. We also talked about that the last podcast. Have a very clear vision of which markets you're going into and invest in them as if they were your, your, your best market, right? If you already decided to go into a market, do the best job you can right. in internationalization and localization. And in terms of Ukraine and Russia, most companies, big companies like Microsoft or Airbnb or Google, whatever, have geopolitical policy. If you have a clear geopolitical policy, it's not the developer that is making decisions on the fly. They just have to comply with the policy for the company. So I'll give you an example. I'm not going to name any names, but we've had a situation at Microsoft where they've made a decision to remove a country from a list of a certain localized bill because they thought it was offensive, right? And that's a... What does that mean? So let's say one country thought another country shouldn't exist. Okay. And so if you're translating for that particular product, you'd say, okay, we'll just remove it so you don't feel offended. And then that goes into the exact reason why you have to have a geopolitical policy. Because you have to have a very good reason to exclude somebody from your product. Yeah. Right? You have to have a very particular reason. It has to be very precise. You have to have a very strong policy. You have to be ready to, to be behind it. And so having a geopolitical policy that coexists with your internationalization effort and your localization effort is a huge piece. It has to be fully integrated. And this is something as a localization engineer, if I run into that with a product, you know, you don't, I'm not going to put that on the developer to decide if the user's in Taiwan and there's no traditional Chinese version, are you going to fall back to simplify Chinese version <laughs> right. or to the English version? Same with uh, France. Um, if somebody's in a French Canada user setting, are you falling back to French, uh, French France or are you falling back mm -hmm. to English? Those are not decisions that the engineer should have to make. Those, like I said, there should be a policy statement as the company has to decide. The legal mm -hmm. department probably has to decide too. They have to talk to their geos. If they have a geo representation, they need right. to talk to them, look at local laws and all these things. These are complex issues and, and really sensitive. Like you said, I mean, the Russia Ukraine thing, you know, with is, mm -hmm. is, is more current uh, with, with having had conflict there recently is even more sensitive. Um, I don't know if the Canadian French is a sensitive. Um, um, mm -hmm. But but because you know um, Canada is bilingual, so um, mm -hmm. falling French, falling back to English might be more acceptable. But it, yeah, there's very sensitive stuff. Yeah, and I do, right. I do believe Ukraine is bilingual, but then the the fallback language should be Ukrainian. Right. But if you don't have the Ukraine, like it should be two locales, right? Like Ukraine, Ukrainian, and Ukrainian yeah. Russian. Um, you could, but you know, I feel like the most neutral decision you could make is just fall back to the source. Like, just show me it's it, it in English. Yeah, it's gonna like you know, other people except for me won't really understand it. But you know, at least at least I'm not I'm not gonna get so mad that I don't want to use Airbnb anymore. <laughs> I'm actually a big fan of user choice too. I mean, if you really want to make sure you don't offend the user, 
give him a choice. Why not pop up a message saying, unfortunately, our application is not available in Ukrainian. W uh, what would you like to pick as your preferred language? And then you get to choose from a list. I mean, that would be really nice too, because you can't offend somebody if you give them a choice or uh, you're less likely to offend them. If your choices are really bad, if the only choices are Spanish and Malay, then you know you may have a problem. But um, I think you use it. sometimes we forget about that. Maybe it doesn't always have to be automated. Sometimes maybe you want to give the user a choice. I mean, in a lot of applications, Facebook, you can go into your settings, you can change change your language, right? Um, or like, what if what if there, it's like an expat that lives in Ukraine and doesn't speak Ukrainian? Like, uh, you know, what language are you going to offer to them? And the most annoying thing is, I think I keep switch, switching it to English and it keeps keep switching back to Russian because I guess my browser keeps sending that I'm in Ukraine. It's, if it's cookie-based, maybe yeah, uh, that yeah, uh, yeah. cookie expires and it defaults back to another language. Uh, yeah. I think it all rolls back to the having a robust enough engineering system to take some of the decisions out of the hands of people who can make mistakes, unintentional mistakes, um, and having a strong policy and strong being a strong advocate of internationalization within the organization allows you to not have these mistakes happen. Yeah, and I think having an international app or building an international product, I think there's responsibility there. Like you have to have some sort of an internationalization strategy for, for reasons like that, for like for political reasons as well. Um, yeah, you can't just like take a website and translate it randomly into many languages because you know you're not going to look very good. And you, and you know you're going to think you're expanding to different markets and you're actually not because you didn't do a good job with that. One, I think it helps when you work for a company that, you know, if they have a lot of products that actually have a, a like you said, a, more, a central strategy where they, I, in, in my case, I, doing work for this one company, they, every product has its own strategy, basically, or no strategy at all. And the language set is always different. And it's like, what are you, who's making those decisions? What is it based on? Why are we doing, you know, um, two versions of Spanish for this product, but only one version of Spanish for this product. You know, why are we not doing um, you know, we, traditional we, Chinese for this? I have no idea. During my time at Windows, we actually had, because the organization is so big and the international strategy wasn't um, very strong, um, there were two things. One is every once in a while I'd bump into a feature PM that I'd, I'd say, hey, you know, these things aren't working very well for Hebrew and Arabic. And, and they'd get back to me and say, oh, we're not going to support these markets. And I say, we're shipping in 120 languages. You're going to support it whether you like it or not, <laughs> right? And so, and then you see the surprise on their face. And um, so then there's that. The other thing is if you don't have a strong strategy, I thrive because I'm going to have a very strong strategy to support Hebrew and Arabic. And so I would laugh because often was the case where Microsoft would invest more in in resources for the Middle East market compared to uh, East Asia, where the user base is much bigger. Because if you're able to advocate and have a strong strategy, they're gonna believe that your market is bigger. The only way you're um, not supporting a market is by actually explicitly restricting that market, right? So if basically you're saying, I am not, we're not, operating in Nigeria at all, we're not allowing a person mm -hmm. in Nigeria to, to order our products, for example, um, then, you know, you could say, okay, we don't have to support that market, but that's, you know, that's the case if for people, for companies that ship, for example, things that say we don't ship to certain locales mm -hmm. and that's fine. You can do that. Um, but you can't do it just based on some settings on a computer because I could be, um, you know, I could be um, a user from a certain country. I travel to the U.S. on business. I'm in the U.S. I want to order something um, from Amazon, have it shipped to my hotel. I should be able to do it just because my settings say I'm in, you know, um, Malaysia. It doesn't, shouldn't restrict me. So you have to be really careful when you say we don't support this or restrict things um, because you're, if you have a product and it's out there on the internet, you could have users anywhere in the world to, we to a certain no degree. idea how the proxy market is thriving here in Israel because everybody's a computer geek and they basically pay for proxy service to make the service think they're in the United States so that they receive the best user experience possible. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> the poorest proxy server available. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. the users are going to hack to get the better user experience. Um, right. 
which means you should probably do a better job at just making the user experience great for everybody. Yeah, and by the way, just to add to that, all of my devices, uh, like the lang the UI language is in it's English. I switch everything to English immediately, just because I know that they didn't like they paid more attention to English than Ukrainian, and I'm already fluent in English. The problem is, you know, it's not a problem for me, but uh, you know, I am a kind of a rare case. I live in Ukraine. And I'm fluent in English. Um, mm. I know that like my dad. He's not going to figure out a lot of apps. Like he, there were like some apps that he wanted to use, and there was not a Ukrainian translation for that. Um, that was really disappointing. Um, yeah, so I just, I just, I just know that there will be problems, and I will get annoyed. So might mm. might as well just default to English immediately. Well, the other thing is, if you actually have an app that's not, you know, super heavy in user interface, and if you internationalize mm. it properly, which doesn't have to take more time than developing a poorly internationalized app if you if you have to just you have to start out right right but actually developing right into code is not harder mm -hmm. just because it's internationalized but basically i mean you're you're just writing it a little differently you just have to know the concepts the actual translating your application is not probably not that cost intensive unless it's again it's a huge amount of user interface so you have a huge amount of documentation but if it's a simple app and maybe has a thousand words adding a few more languages to open up that user you know that that country that those open it up to those users is probably not that expensive right yeah. but if it's poorly internationalized then it's gonna, it's gonna get expensive there used to be, there used to be a time where the geofence things now the new geofencing is basically we're not going to deploy our app to certain stores you know because every every company has stores that are regional based so like the app store in israel is very different than the app store in the united states and so a lot of application developers just don't um, sh don't deploy to that particular store because they don't want to have to support that user base, for example. Um, yeah, it's it's a very interesting problem. Um, yeah, what? same in Ukraine. Like uh, very many apps, uh, you know, you find them online and then you click and it's like, it's not available in, in your app store. Yeah, and I understand that if it's for legal reasons or, you know, whatever, then there's some hurdles. Obviously, they have to jump through. But if it's literally just for, you know, basically laziness because they don't want to make it ready for that, uh, you know, for that country or user base, that's, to me, that's really sad. <laughs> By the way, Oksana, in the... You know, we you mentioned you use English. I I had to go back to English, the English version of Windows because I I felt that the quality of the Hebrew version deteriorated to the point where I couldn't use it. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to mention Windows. Um, I use Windows sometimes. I have a Windows machine, and I feel like the like latest versions of Windows, the localization mm -hmm. into Ukraine, it was so. It was so weird. Like, it was just not thought through. There were, like, a lot of concatenations that, you know, didn't make sense. So you could see that the translator received uh, the the character limit, but they handled it really weirdly because in the UI, I don't understand what this button does, um, mm. you know. And, and yeah, and I, I probably even know the person that handled Ukrainian localization to Windows because I met them at some conference and it's like, you know, he didn't do a really good job. He probably received a lot of money for that, but nobody controlled it, you know. So, wow. yeah. I wonder if part of the reason is because we're supporting more form factors, you know, smaller screens, tablets, mm -hmm. um, where you have smaller screens, you have to cram more into a screen. So screen real estate is more restricted. So they're trying to get more creative and actually screwing up the, the you know, the localization <laughs> part for some of those products. Um, more, could more, be. For me, more for me and when I look at all these products and really get disappointed is that I don't feel that there's any innovation in the in the multilingual international space. Like where is the great innovation? Why do we still have the same text input experience for the last 20 years? Why isn't anybody thinking about looking at it and maybe improving it? Why are things like when was the last time any of us were excited by something, by a feature that gave us a really great experience for international or multilingual users. Yeah, it's such a it's such a you know old idea. Remember like in 2005 everybody was saying that everybody would speak English eventually. Um, and then you know and everybody was saying we're going to have one language and one culture in like in 100 words uh, in 100 years or whatever. And then but now what I'm seeing is 
I don't know, people tend to cling to their own languages. Like I am an exception because it's my job to speak English this way. But people mm. don't like they don't want to waste their time getting fluent in some language that they didn't grow up with. I think it's a really false idea. I think we want to create like, you know, more comfortable uh, experiences for people mm -hmm. everywhere. Like they are not going to switch to English. They may be, they may learn it, you know, badly just to get around, but you know, we're not going to have one language and one culture. I think it, it's like a very imperialistic idea from the, from the U uh, US and stuff like that. that. <laughs> very imperialistic and, uh, um, like, where's the innovation? Like, how do we push things to the next level? What's the vision? Like, what do we have as an industry, as a vision that says, we'd love to have this experience. Forget the technology, okay? Put the technology aside, what we're able to do, what we're unable to do. Where's the vision? Like, where do we want to see things in, in five, 10 years? Like, I'd love to see, you know, when we say uh, inclusive language, and I'm going to take that that uh, term you use because I love it, Oksana. Thank you. Not gender-based innovation, but inclusive language. How do we get to a point, for example, where if I write a Facebook post and I post it, you know, today Facebook says, "Would you like to translate this?" But how do we make it so it's more natural, so that it 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 tailors to the person that's reading it in a way that the author feels that he trusts the platform to present his content in different ways, right? Like how do we evolve the ecosystem so that we're able to communicate better with, with, the, with the power of technology and, and, and do very, very good things, right? Yeah, and here's another, another gripe of mine about that um, Facebook machine translation. Mm -hmm. I have many Russian-speaking friends on my Facebook page, whether they are from Russia or just from Ukraine, but they prefer mm -hmm. to speak Russian in their everyday life. I mean, it's not a problem. But Facebook insists on translating all of it in English. Like, okay, if somebody posts uh, something in, in Hebrew, yeah, I'm not mm -hmm. going to be able to read it, translate it. But if it's a friend who made a post in Russian, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't need, like, I would like to see the original. The original is more useful to me than this mm -hmm. bad English machine translation. And mm -hmm. then and sometimes it's a joke. Like there are many like comedic uh, accounts that post jokes, j jokes and then Facebook translates it and ruins it for me. And I don't get that, you know, immediate, you know, I saw, I saw the meme, I saw the joke and I laughed because now I had to click and see the original, which is really annoying. So this feed is ruined for me, basically. And then recently, this girl, um, she published something in French, but it was like a French meme, you know, like, um, uh, you know, like this is not a pipe, this is not a pipe, uh, this meme from from like a French uh, painter. And so she posted something similar, but it translated that French phrase into English, thereby ruining you know the idea you know the creativity mm -hmm. it just took it just sucks all of the creativity from my facebook page mm -hmm. um and it's really annoying and there's no way for me to tell hey facebook you know some countries are more nuanced like some people are more nuanced i prefer to see some stuff in english but if but if you know if it's somebody from ukraine posting in russian i want to see that in russian you know mm -hmm. it because my country is complicated and like yeah. my life my life well, is complicated it's it's, it's, it's an, Right, being being smart enough, context sensitive to understand who's reading your content. Yeah, exactly. Who posted the content and what what are some of the decisions that can come around? Yeah, and think and if, like the the person that made that this that that you know code that wrote that code that translates everything into English, mm -hmm. they just assumed oh this person uses English UI, so they mm -hmm. want to see all of the posts in English. Yeah. It's it, like, that's not why I chose the UI. I chose the UI in, in English because the Ukrainian translation is bad. <laughs> well, and you yeah. mentioned about the innovation and, you know, language features and, and, and I'm actually worried about that. I'm worried about it because a lot of the large companies outsource more and more of the localization work. So mm -hmm. actually the people who are knowledgeable about these things are more disconnected from the teams that, or the, mm -hmm. you know, the people who will make those decisions. We don't have as much leverage as we, if we work mm -hmm. for a vendor. You know, even in our case, we actually work with customers for one large company, fairly integrated, where we work within their environment. We have accounts in their, in their company. We work basically inside their company mm -hmm. as contractors. And um, 
So we do have a little bit of an advantage, but it's still, you know, we're still not working for the same company. So it's mm-hmm. actually very, very difficult to influence people. And I think it's going to become more difficult. Uh, I think a company you have to consciously, de- consciously decide that that's something we want to do. And it has to be part of the culture. And I, I just see that actually kind of fading away, sadly. Yeah. I believe, I, I, yeah. I think it is fading away. I think it's kind of in the user's hands. I believe in sort of like a decentralized experience where, where you know, anybody can translate anything they see, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and control what they see. And it's very, it's a complicated idea and it's very hard. But it's not really in the user's hand either because that, again, it goes back to unconscious cultural bias. Yeah. It, was, it, it, is, it, is, it is exactly that. It's unconscious cultural bias. The minute you take internationalization quality and uh, innovation and say, oh, if the user complains about it, we'll fix it, then that's unconscious cultural bias, right? Um, and so it's not in the user's hand. It's uh, as, as, and as, as, um, as an industry, we're in a big problem because just like you said, um, you know, as a vendor, w- what are you going to prioritize, your job or your feedback? It's actually one of the, what you just said about, you know, the feedback. Right? Like, are you going to provide feedback to the point where they're going to say, oh, it's, he's just a vendor. Let's, 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 um, let's get another vendor. One, the user part, the user part, user feedback is, it's it's such a red herring when people say, well, if our product was bad, we would hear about it from users. Mm -hmm. How often when you work on, with a product that's that's you don't think is great from a user experience to localization, whatever it is, do you really go back to the company and send them a complaint email? You know, most people don't. That people just abandon the product. I mean, there's yeah. so much feedback you're not getting if your application's not good. You're probably yeah, going to get some. I mean, if it doesn't work, like if if Zoom all of a sudden their meetings don't connect anymore, of course they would hear about it pretty quickly, right? But that's not the things I'm worried about. I'm worried about the user experience, the more subtle things that just make a product not as appealing and then you abandon it you don't get that feedback from users if you think you're going to get that feedback from users and then you can make a change that that's just not reality so you have to make sure that your product is usable for all the target audience in all the countries and all the languages you have to that's why you do testing sometimes you might do some end user testing right um with, especially with new products do some end user testing get some feedback um Testing is the, and, and that's another thing where when people say testing should catch this. Testing is an afterthought. Testing is the end of the chain, the, the food chain. And so being able to design and research your users properly makes more sense because that's, you know, that goes back to the core internationalization development. If your designer is able to convey to the developer what the experience should be for international markets, then he's going to save a lot of time um, and a lot of money. And so that's why I think like the, it really goes back to the designers and not the testers and not the developers as much. It goes back to the designers um, so that they're able to convey a very cohesive vision of where, which markets we're going into and what are the different design changes we have to do in order to accommodate for these markets and not necessarily throw it at the developer or the testing team because that's too late. When testers don't use the product in all the different ways that the end users use them, you know, end users are very creative and everybody's using a product differently. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, for example, I use Quicken for managing my finances. I don't Mm -hmm. use any of the budgeting functions. I don't care if they don't work because I don't use them. I don't budget, right? But Mm -hmm. so every user is different. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that testing doesn't cover a lot of those scenarios. That's why Mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, maybe you do a promotion where you say, hey, if you want to do give some user feedback, we're going to give you, you know, a gift certificate or something. You could sign up. That's 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 where we're dying. That's where that's where somebody like me sits there and goes. I've I've had people from Microsoft approach me and say, "Hey, we're having a raffle. If you win, if you submit some bugs, we'll give you a hundred dollar Amazon gift card." And I said, "No, I'm not even going to bother." And you know why? Because you really need a subject matter expert to come in and tell you what's broken. You don't need users to come in and tell you what's broken. That's not the way things are built and designed. And 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 to prove the point. I actually documented about 110 bugs with the Hebrew version of Windows, published it on LinkedIn, 
sent it to the folks at Microsoft, to the exact folks that were supposed to fix these bugs, waited three or four iterations for them to fix anything, and guess what? Nothing got fixed. Well, and I'm not saying you, it's going to replace the SME, you know, feedback. Of course, it's it's one more thing. I mean, find a way to get some user feedback because people are not going to spontaneously give you user feedback. That's that's the point I'm trying to make. It's not replacing any other. You have to do all of it. You have to right. do internationalization testing, localization testing, usability testing, um, you know, SME testing, whatever you want to call it. You have to do all of that. Plus, in addition, maybe if you can solicit some user feedback, that mm-hmm. would be you know useful on top of it. So that that was my point. That was exactly that. And I think when you look at some of the feedback programs that are available today, some of the smaller markets are going to suffer because their feedback is drowned in in other feedback. And that's a problem. Like Nobody's been able to scale their feedback program. None of the big tech companies are not able to scale right. their big feedback programs to some some of the larger markets. Even. Forget about the smallest markets, right? Yeah. Like, do, you, do we have a French version of the Windows Insiders program or does Facebook have a feedback program that, that actually speaks French, talks to French customers, solicits French feedback, everything in French? Probably not. Yeah, don't uh, do it if you're not going to do anything with it, right? No. Hey, we're over two hours and haven't had breakfast yet. <laughs> I didn't brush my teeth. Yeah, that's a good that's, that's that's a good reminder. Yes, let's start wrapping things up. Actually, let's wrap things up because I think I wanted to start wrapping things up half an hour ago. <laughs> but I let you guys discuss because you guys have so much experience to share. We have a comment from Julia from Shopify. I think I maybe said Spotify before, but let me correct that. She's from Shopify. Thanks for such an interesting and long conversation. Need to go, but loved it. So. I guess nice. it's time for us to go as well. Do you guys have any final comments, shout outs? How was your experience? This is a lot of fun, but all I can say to people out there working in the localization industry, bring up internationalization issues, push for it, evangelize, you know, to educate people on it. It's it don't stop doing that um because you we're going to lose something if we don't do that. Mm-hmm. Um you know, have a person or some people allocated to do that kind of work. Make sure all your engineers and QA people and have some experience there too, so they all can talk about it intelligently and and help customers. And then, you know, the more people know about that stuff, the the more change we can bring to to localization. And you know, you have to learn to show the customer what they get out of it. There has to be a benefit for them. So you have to be mm-hmm. able to show that benefit, but keep doing that. Mm-hmm. I, I think keep dreaming big. <laughs> don't 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 let this situation kind of drag you down. We have a lot to offer. There's plenty of great talented people in the industry. We have to be cognizant about identifying the bottlenecks and not necessarily living by them and changing it, changing and, and moving forward. And I think everything comes and goes, right? And if we're feeling that the certain elements are in a regression right now, there's going to come a time where they get their attention again. And so we, we should be ready. Say, um, you know, going international is a responsibility and you have that responsibility before, you know, the translators, but also your target market. So, you know, take it, take it to heart. Like, don't, you know, uh, y- you can, you know, y- you don't have to spend a ton of money to do it right. You just have to care. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that, that would be my final message. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Oksana. Thank you, Bad. Thank you, Gilad, for the two hour long conversation about internationalization. <laughs> Uh, finally, I want to thank everyone in the chat on the social medias that was active with us. We will have a recording of this available to you. So no worries if you missed any parts of it or if you want to come back to something that the guests share today. And we will see you sometime soon. So bye-bye. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye.